Lesson number 296, Surah Al-Jinn, Ayah number 1 to 28. Surah Al-Jinn is a Makki Surah, and this Surah revolves around one main topic. And what is that? The Jinn. The Jinn, who they are, what they do, their behavior, their actions. This Surah completely speaks about the Jinn. And in their behavior, which is described in this surah is a great lesson for us which is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is informing us about the jinn what they said how they believed what they said to one another what kind of actions they used to do or they do still and the word jinn is from the root letters jim noon noon jannah what does jannah mean to conceal to hide something and the jinn are called jinn why because they are completely hidden from the senses of man. We cannot see them, we cannot hear them, we cannot smell them, we cannot touch them. They are completely concealed from us. In Surah Al-A'raf, Ayah 27, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to us, إِنَّهُ يَرَاكُمْ هُوَ وَقَبِيلُهُ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا تَرَوْنَهُمْ Indeed, He sees you, He and His tribe, meaning shaitan and His people, from where you do not see them. Meaning, you do not see them, but they see you. They are hidden from your senses. And remember that the jinn, they are a world other than that of the world of mankind and the world of the angels. So just as there is an alam of human beings, there is an alam of angels, there is also an alam of the jinn. And there are about 40 ayat of the Qur'an that mention the jinn, that speak about the jinn. And they are mentioned in 10 different surahs of the Qur'an. And an entire surah is in fact named after the jinn. This is just like an entire surah is named after who? Al-Insan. So there is also a surah which is about al-jinn. This shows to us that it is necessary for a person to believe in the existence of the jinn. Because if a person does not believe in the existence of the jinn, then in fact what is he denying? He is denying Qur'an. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala very, very clearly mentions the jinn in the Qur'an. And they are mentioned differently from who? The angels. The angels we know, لا يعصون الله ما أمرهم. The angels do not disobey Allah at all. And the jinn on the other hand, we learn that they would, many acts of disobedience of the jinn has been mentioned in the Qur'an. For example, about Iblis, Aba was takbara, he refused to obey. كان من الجن, he was of the jinn. So it's necessary that we believe that jinn are who? A completely different creation other than that of human beings, other than that of the angels. They are a world of their own. Some people, they deny the existence of the jinn because they say we cannot see the jinn. We do not know them. But the fact is that just because you cannot see something does not mean it does not exist. We learn in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَيَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنِ الرُّوحِ قُلِ الرُّوحُ مِنْ أَمْرِ رَبِّي وَمَا أُوتِيتُ مِنَ الْعِلْمِ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا You have been given only very little knowledge. So with little knowledge, if you cannot see the jinn, if you cannot comprehend the world of the jinn, then does it mean you deny that? No. There are many things that people cannot see, cannot perceive, but just because you cannot perceive it does not mean you reject it. Similarly, there are people who misinterpret the concept of the jinn, meaning they say that jinn are like germs. When germs were discovered, they said, oh, this is the jinn. And some say that jinn are basically the evil inclination of a person. This concept of shaitan, it's not literal. It's just metaphorical that how a person is inclined to do evil, this is what shaitan is. Or some people say that no, jinn are angels. However, all of this is incorrect. From the Qur'an and Sunnah, it is very, very clear that who are jinn? A different creation, another creation. And believing in them is necessary. If a person denies them, rejects them, in fact, he is rejecting what? The Qur'an. He is rejecting the Sunnah. And the jinn, they are very similar to human beings in the sense that they possess intellect, they possess reason, they possess understanding, and they have the ability to make choices. Angels as well, they have reason, understanding as well, 
But do they have the ability to make choices the way humans and jinns do? No. They are obedient to Allah. They are programmed to obey Allah. They never disobey Allah. They have no evil inclination in them. But on the other hand, the jinn and human beings, they have the ability to make choices. To choose between right and wrong, good and bad. Which is why just as human beings are mukallaf, the jinn are also mukallaf. What does it mean by that? That they are also being tested. On the day of judgment, even they will be held accountable. And even they will be punished or rewarded. As we have learned in Surah Al-Rahman, that in the ayah which tells us, لَمْ يَطْمِثْهُنَّ إِنْسٌ قَبْلَهُمْ وَلَا جَانٌ What does that show? The jinn also will be rewarded in Jannah, those of them who are righteous. And those of them who are disobedient, evil, where will they end up? In hellfire with Iblis and all of his junood. And with the Prophet ﷺ, he was sent as a messenger to who? The human beings as well as the jinn. Which is why we see that at various occasions, the Prophet ﷺ in fact recited the Qur'an to the jinn. He taught them. He delivered the message to them as well. Now if you think about it, this concept of jinn is found in almost every society, especially every Muslim society. Whether you go to the east or the west, north or the south, anywhere you go, you will find people believing in the jinn and they have many stories to share about the jinn as well. Even little children, they are also very familiar with the jinn. But many times there are wrong concepts that exist amongst people about the jinn. Which is why it's necessary for us to study what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about the jinn. Who are they? What do they do? What abilities do they have? What weaknesses do they have? Because generally there are two extremes found amongst people. One extreme is that some people completely reject the concept of jinn. And other people, they are obsessed with the jinn. Obsessed to the point of thinking that everything is caused by the jinn. Every difficulty they suffer, every fear they suffer, every movement of any door or anything is caused by the jinn. So they get overly obsessed. And every time they have to talk about something interesting, they have jinn stories to share. And so there are two extremes that are found amongst people. And our responsibility is that we should come to know what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about the jinn, because this is also a part of iman. And if a person does not have the correct belief concerning the jinn, even it could lead to shirk, it could lead to ghulu. Or it could lead to kufr Because a person rejecting the jinn means rejecting the Qur'an So it's very very important that we learn about what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us concerning them Now remember that there are many types of jinn The common word that is used to refer to the jinn is al-jinn And there are those jinn that live in the houses of people And such jinn are known as amir No need to be afraid because remember that every person is accompanied by a Shaitan as well, right? And that shaitan inspires what in him? Evil in him, waswasa in him. Isn't it so? So there are some jinn that live in the houses of people and they are known as amir. What does amir mean? From ya'muru, one who dwells. And there are those jinn that attach themselves to children as well. And they are known as arwah. Then there are those jinn that try to cause harm to people. And who are they? Shayateen. Then there are those jinn that try to harm the people in a very extreme way and such jinn are called marid. Worse than shaitan is who? Marid. And worse than marid is known as ifrit. The Prophet ﷺ said there is a hadith which is reported in Tabarani and Bayhaqi and this is an authentic hadith in which he said that the jinn are of three types. The jinn are of three types. One type which flies through the air. So there are those jinn that can actually fly in the air. And as we will learn in the surah, وَأَنَّا لَمَسْنَ السَّمَاءِ That the jinn, they go up to the skies in order to listen to the conversations of the angels. So there are those that fly through the air. And remember, at the time of Sulaiman when he asked that who can bring the throne for me, the ifrit of the jinn, he said, I can bring it to you. And obviously how would he go and come back? By flying. Another type which is snakes and dogs. So some jinn, they take the form of snakes and dogs. Now it does not mean that every dog is a jinn and every snake is a jinn. Okay? This is not what it means. But some snakes and some dogs, they are in fact what? Jinn. Which is why before killing them, before harming them, what should a person do? Give a warning. Inshallah, I will tell you about that in detail later. 
and one which move from place to place. Meaning, another type of jinn that move from place to place. Now remember that the jinn, they eat, they drink, they get married, and they also have children. What's the evidence of the jinn eating and drinking? Any evidence from Quran and Sunnah that you know? That we are not allowed to use bones for cleaning ourselves. Why? Because it is the food of jinn. We learn from a hadith, Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu, he said that the Prophet sallallahu once asked him to bring him some stones so that he could clean himself after using the toilet. And he said to him that do not bring me bones or dung. So Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu asked him later that, you know, you told me not to bring bones and dung. May I know the reason behind that? He said that they are the food of the jinn. A delegation of the jinn of Nusaybin came to me and what good jinn they are. Why? Because they were believers. And asked me for provision. So I prayed to Allah for them. And asked that they should not pass by any bone or dung that they would find food on it. So the bones are food for the jinn and dung is the food of the jinn's animals. Okay. Any other evidence that you know? That the jinn eat and drink? That we have been told to say Bismillah before we eat. Because if we don't then what's going to happen? Shaitan will eat of that food and drink. Any other evidence? Remember that ayah that Ya ayyuha alladhina amanu innama al-khamru wal-maysiru wal-ansabu wal-azlamu rijusun min amal shaytan That khamr is what? Min amal shaytan Ibn Qayyim he said that it is called amal shaytan because shaytan drinks khamr. Shaytan is the one who drinks khamr. He likes khamr. So when a person drinks khamr, who participates in that with him? Shaytan is one. Okay. What's the evidence that they get married? The fact that there are male jinn and the female jinn that Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al-khubuthi wal-khaba'is In this surah also we will learn Rijalu min al-jinn So this shows that there are men amongst them and women amongst them That shaitan laying eggs in the marketplace And the zurriya, the offspring of shaitan is mentioned in the Quran أَفَتَتَّخِذُونَهُ وَذُرِّيَّتَهُ أَوْلِيَاءَ مِن دُونِي وَهُمْ لَكُمْ عَدُوا In Surah Al-Kahf so if shaitan has dhurriya, then obviously the jinn, they get married as well. And remember the ayah in Surah Al-Rahman, لَمْ يَطْمِثُنَّ إِنْسٌ قَبْلَهُمْ وَلَا جَانٌ So what does that mean? That the jinn will also be rewarded in a similar way in paradise. And remember that the jinn, they also suffer from death. They are not eternal beings. They suffer from death just as human beings do. But it is said that in general they live longer lives than human beings. Now, remember that jinn, some of them are evil and some of them are righteous. Just like amongst people, there are those who are disobedient, wicked, and there are those who are righteous. And those who are wicked amongst them, those who are evil amongst them, what do they do? They try to harm people in various ways. Amongst the other evil things they do, they also try to harm people. Remember Junood of Iblis, the armies of Iblis, what do they do? They go, misguide people. Amongst the things they do is that they cast waswasa to a person, for example, when he's doing wudu, when he's praying the salah. When a person is going out in the way of Allah, shaitan creates difficulties for him, casts waswasa in his heart, rises other people against him. So all of this is what? The activities of which kind of jinn? Those who are evil amongst them They also harass people Now the evil jinn Often live in deserted And dirty places Deserted and dirty places And they gather in places where they can Cause mischief such as Marketplaces And they spread At what time when darkness falls And the jinn In general they love to sit between The shade and the sun this is something that perhaps many people don't know. That where there is shade and sun, so basically where the shade and sun meet, that is where shayateen love to sit. This is why we have been told not to sit in such places. You understand? So for example, you're sitting somewhere and you're sitting in the shade. Because of the movement of the sun, eventually what happens? You're half in the sun, half in the shade. So in such places we're told not to sit. Why? Because the shayateen love to sit in such places. And the jinn have many abilities that people don't have. And this is just like 
other creatures also have many abilities that people don't have birds can fly can you fly no bees can make honey can you make honey so what's there to be afraid about jinn they're a different creation allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given each creation unique abilities so just because they have an ability doesn't mean we become afraid of them you understand now amongst the abilities that they have that people don't have is the ability to move quickly from one place to the other remember the incident of ifrit min al jinn that he said that i can come to you before you get up from your place and they reached space before people did we managed to reach space when much later and the jinn have been going up to the skies since a very very long time in order to eavesdrop similarly they're very skillful in whatever they do they're very skillful how at the time of suleiman or lisanan he made the jinn work for him If you think about it, he had many armies of people as well. But did he use them to construct all those buildings, to dive into the waters and extract all those precious things from there? No. So he used the jinn. Why? Because the jinn have special ability. They have more physical strength in a way compared to human beings. Similarly, they have the ability to change their form as well. They can appear in different forms. Remember how Shaytan came in the form of an Arab leader to the Mushrikeen at the Battle of Badr. encouraging them to go and fight against the muslims similarly remember the story of abu hurairah radhiyallahu anhu how he was guarding the wealth of zakat in the night shaitan came and started stealing and he came in the form of a young boy and from another hadith we learned that his hands were like that of a dog like paws so they have the ability to come in different forms as well similarly they can appear in the form of snakes as well and remember that those snakes especially that are found in the house not any snake that you find outside the snake in the house that could be a jinn which is why we see in sahih muslim abu sa'id al khudri he narrated that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said in medina there are jinn who have become muslim so if you see any of them meaning he was referring to a snake warn them and give them 3 days to leave then if it appears to you after that then kill it for it is a devil and there is a story which we learn as well about Abu Sa'id al-Khudri he said that we learn from this narration that once another person came to visit him and Abu Sa'id al-Khudri was praying at that time in his house and this person he came because Abu Sa'id was praying he just sat down and waited for him to finish his salah but while he was waiting he heard some movement and when he looked it was a snake so he got up to kill the snake Abu Sa'id was praying and he you know gestured to him that just sit down don't kill the snake after he finished the salah he said to him do you see that house he said yes He said, in that house used to live a young man who had recently gotten married and we went with the Prophet ﷺ to the Khandaq. So everybody was at the trench. And you know how difficult it was. All the believers were there. They were digging and after that they were constantly guarding the trenches as well. So the Prophet ﷺ allowed that young man to go home one day because he had recently gotten married. So when he got home, his wife was standing outside. And young boy, Arab, Rira, he's like, how dare you stand outside? He got very upset with her. and she said to him that you know before you say anything to me before you do anything go and look inside so when he went there was a huge black snake that was sitting in the house so because of that she had come outside and he took whatever weapon he had and he struck the snake and instantly the house shook and the people said we don't know if it was the snake that died first or that young man who died first and when the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was informed about it he said to the people that when you see something like this in your house then don't attack that snake instantly give it 3 days give it warning that leave otherwise we will kill you and if it appears to you again only then kill that jinn so just remember this that a snake in the house is jinn not outside of the house okay and every snake in the house again is not jinn it could be okay which is why we should give warning and which is why we should constantly recite the quran recite surah al baqara surah ali imran right and make sure we say the dua when we enter the house when we exit the house so that shaitan does not find any place in our house you understand it's very very important for us to do all of this now where the jinn have many abilities they also have many weaknesses and this is very similar to every creation of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala where they have certain abilities they also have certain inabilities certain weaknesses what are the weaknesses that the jinn have that they have no authority over the righteous slaves of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
The righteous slaves of Allah, they have no authority over them. They cannot harm them. They cannot frighten them. They cannot harass them. And in fact, they are afraid of the righteous servants of Allah. And it's not just that they are afraid, but they actually flee from them. They run away from them. Any evidence behind that? Umar رضي الله Because he was so strong in his iman, this is why the shaitan was even afraid of him. The Prophet ﷺ said about him that you know when he would go on a path, shaitan would take another path. He didn't even want to come close to Umar رضي الله Similarly, we see that the jinn, they are under human beings in the sense that they are lesser than human beings. Because Sulaiman salam, to him the jinn were subjected. Isn't it so? Human beings are not subjected to the jinn, but the jinn were subjected to who? Sulaiman salam. Similarly, the jinn, they cannot appear in the form of the messenger in dreams. Shayateen cannot do that. And they are unable to go beyond a certain limit in space. And Amongst her weaknesses is that if a door has been locked and the name of Allah has been mentioned over it, a jinn cannot open it. Shaitan cannot open it. If a door was locked, it was closed, and the name of Allah was mentioned over it at that time. So let's say you were going out of the house, you were stepping out, you close the door, you're locking, you say Bismillah. Then what's going to happen? Shaitan cannot enter your house. He cannot go through that door. He cannot open that door. Now, where they have abilities, they have weaknesses. As I mentioned earlier, there are those of them who are righteous, there are those of them who are unrighteous. And the evil jinn, they're also of different levels. Some are like Iblis. Some are lesser than Iblis. Some are lesser than them as well. So they vary in their evil nature as well. You understand? They vary in their evil nature as well. Just as they vary in their good nature. Now we'll inshallah study the surah and we will see what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about the jinn. And there are a few more things which inshallah I will mention as we study the surah. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Qul uhiya ilayya annahu stama'a nafarun min al jinni. Fakalu inna samirna Quranan ajaba. Say, O Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that it has been revealed to me. Qul, you tell the people that uhiya ilayya, it has been revealed to me. Meaning, I have been informed about this. How? Through revelation. I didn't see it myself. I didn't hear it myself. I didn't witness it myself. Because jinn are hidden from us. So the Prophet ﷺ was informed about this. How? Through revelation. What was he informed about? That annahu, that indeed he, istama'a nafarun min al jinni. A group of the jinn listened attentively. They listened attentively to what? To my recitation. When the Prophet ﷺ was reciting the Quran. And who was it that listened to him? Nafarun min al jinn. Nafar is from the root letters, noon fa ra. And nafar is used for a group of people, a group of individuals who are numbered between 3 and 10. Some say more than 10 even, but generally it is said that somewhere between 3 and 10. And the word nafar appears to be singular. It is in fact ism jama, which the word itself is wahid, however it gives meaning of plural. Just as the word qawm itself is wahid, but it applies to who? Many people. So nafarun min al jinni. A group of the jinn, they listened attentively to my recitation. And when they listened, what did they say? فَقَالُوا So they said, إِنَّا سَمِعْنَا قُرْآنًا عَجَبًا They said to their people, when they returned to them, that indeed we have heard a Qur'an that is عَجَبًا That is amazing. That is most astonishing. عَجَب is from عَيْن جِيمْبَ and عَجَب is to marvel, to be amazed at something. And it's used in two ways. First of all, it gives the meaning of inkar. That you find something very strange, ajeeb, weird, and as a result you reject it. You don't accept it. Secondly, ajab is also of istihsan, which is to be impressed by something, to wonder at something, to be surprised at it, 
and to find it very amazing. So one is such ajab that leads to rejection and the other is such ajab that leads to amazement, being impressed, to marvel. So inna sami'na Qur'an an ajaba, which ajab is this? Of istihsan. That we have heard a Qur'an that is extremely amazing, that is surprising, that is mind-blowing. And it is a reality that there is nothing like the Qur'an in its ajab, in its clarity, in the richness of its meanings, in its eloquence, and its many other aspects. The Qur'an amazes the listener, it amazes the leader with its eloquence. So these jinn also, when they heard the Qur'an, what was their first reaction? That, inna سَمِعْنَا قُرْآنًا ajaba. We have heard a Qur'an that is very amazing. Now, when did this happen? Remember that this incident, which is being mentioned over here, is different from the one that is mentioned in Surah Al-Ahqaf. In Surah Al-Ahqaf, were mentioned those jinn that heard the Prophet ﷺ recite the Qur'an on his way back from Ta'if. And those jinn were who? What was their belief before? They were Ahlul Kitab, remember? Because they mentioned the book of Musa. Because they are the ones who believed in it and followed it. And these jinn who heard the Prophet ﷺ at this point, they were mushrikeen, as we will learn in the following ayat. And when exactly did this happen? We learn in Bukhari and Muslim, Ibn Abbas anhu, he said that the Messenger of Allah وسلم, went out along with a group of his companions towards Rukaz marketplace. The Prophet وسلم, would go to public places such as Mina at the time of Hajj, similarly the Haram throughout the day and the night because there were people coming from all over in order to perform their rituals. Similarly, he would also go to the marketplaces. Why? In order to do da'wah. So once he went to Rukaz market. At that time, something intervened between the devils and the news of the heaven. And the flames were being sent down upon them, so the devils would return. Remember that the shayateen, they go up to the heaven in order to listen. So when they went up to listen, they could not go and listen. So they found that very strange, that what's going on? We could easily go and listen. And now all of a sudden when we go, there are flames that chase us, that kill us. So what's going on? So the jinn, they said, something has intervened between us and the news of the heaven. There's something that has come between us and the news of the heaven, and fires have been shot at us. So their fellow devil said, nothing has intervened between you and the news of the heaven, but an important event has happened. Meaning, whatever is going on is something very important, something very special, something very unique is going on. Because... Otherwise, we would not have been prevented in this way. Therefore, travel all over the world, east and west, and try to find out what has happened. It is said that the jinn, they even went up to Iblis to ask him what was going on. And Iblis said something special is going on. So go and find out what's happening. Travel all over the world, go east and west, and try to find out what has happened. What does that show? They don't have knowledge of the unseen. And so they set out and traveled all over the world, east and west, looking for that thing which intervened between them and the news of the heaven. Those of the devils who had set out towards the Hama went to Allah's Messenger وسلم, at Nakhla. That was a place between Mecca and Ta'if. While he was on his way to Ukaz market. So the Prophet وسلم, was on his way to Ukaz, and there was a group of the jinn who were going about in that area, trying to figure out what's going on. And they met him while he was offering the Fajr prayer with his companions. And when they heard the Qur'an being recited, they listened to it and they said to each other, this is the thing which has intervened between you and the news of the heavens. This is it. And then they returned to their people. They went back to the rest of the jinn and they said, oh our people, we have really heard a wonderful Qur'an. It gives guidance to the right and we have believed in it. We shall not join in worship anybody with our Lord. So when this happened, when they went to their people and shared this with them, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that قُلْ أُوحِيَ إِلَيَّ أَنَّهُ اسْتَمَعَ نَفَرٌ مِّنَ الْجِنِّ فَقَالُوا إِنَّا سَمِعْنَا قُرْآنًا عَجَبًا The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was told about this entire incident and he was told to also inform the people about this incident. And remember that over here the jinn came and listened to him reciting the Qur'an. 
And this was not the only time, nor was the time when they listened to him, which was mentioned in Surah Al-Ahqaf, the only time. We learned that at several occasions, many occasions, the jinn came to the Prophet ﷺ, they heard the Qur'an or they invited him. And if we collect all of the narrations, we find that at least this happened six times. At least six times. That the Prophet ﷺ, he recited them, they listened to him. And this is just what we know. Allahu A'lam, how many other times they listened. So over here in the ayah, what do we see? The reaction of the jinn when they heard the Qur'an. And what was that reaction? That they understood immediately. Inna sami'na Quran and ajaba. We have heard a recitation, a Quran that is amazing. This is not the word of a human being. This is not an ordinary kalam. This is something very special. This is because of which we cannot go up and listen to the news of the heavens anymore. And they immediately understood the essence of the Quran. What is that? That yahdi ila rushdi. It guides to the right course. This Qur'an, it guides to rushd. What does rushd mean? Rushd is guidance, right conduct, the state of being on hidayah, the state of being in receipt of guidance. So when a person has received guidance, and as a result, he adopts good ways and manners, and he's also firm on the right way, this is what rushd is. So the Qur'an, it guides to right way, it guides to the truth. It guides to faith. It guides to tawheed. Everything the Qur'an tells you about, what is it? Ar-rushd. فَآمَنَّا بِهِ Therefore, we have believed in this Qur'an. So the jinn who heard the Prophet ﷺ reciting the Qur'an, and it wasn't the entire Qur'an that they heard, by the way. It was only a part of the Qur'an they heard. Immediately when they went to their people, they said, يَهْدِي إِلَى الرُّشْدِ فَآمَنَّا بِهِ It guides to the right, and we have believed in it. وَلَمْ نُشْرِكَ بِرَبِّنَا أَحَدًا And never will we do shirk with our Lord, anyone at all. Meaning we will never ever equate any of His creation with Him. We will never ever ascribe any partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just imagine, they heard the Qur'an once, and they immediately understood the message of the Qur'an. That first of all, it leads to the right way. And secondly, shirk is not right. They got the message. Isn't that amazing? How is it possible that they got the message? Because istama'a, they listened attentively. And remember, istama'a is when a person listens very carefully, attentively, paying attention to every single word. Why would a person do that? Because he doesn't want to miss out on any detail. He doesn't want to miss out on any point at all. This is active listening. And when a person is listening actively, first of all, he gets all of the main points, and secondly, he's also using his mind, he's analyzing the information, so he can actually benefit from it. So, look at them. They heard a part of the Qur'an, and they understood whatever the Qur'an guides to, it is right, and shirk is not right. Therefore, we will never ever do shirk. وَأَنَّهُ تَعَالَى جَدُّ رَبِّنَا And... It teaches, meaning the Qur'an tells us that ta'ala, that it is exalted. What is exalted? Jaddu Rabbina, the nobleness of our Lord. The nobleness of our Lord is very, very exalted. He is above everyone. So therefore, matakhada sahibatan, he has not taken any wife, wala walada, nor any son. His nobleness is very exalted. Therefore, he doesn't have a wife. He doesn't have any child. He is above everyone and everything. But notice how they mention the glory of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That ta'ala jaddu rabbina. What does ta'ala mean? It is exalted from ulu. When we say Allah ta'ala, what does it mean? Allah who is exalted. Allah who is high and sublime. This is from Ulu. And Jad is from the root letters Jim Dal Dal. What does Jad mean? Jad is glory, greatness, sublimity. It is basically to be greater than the other. To be greater than the other. To have authority. Anas anhu he said, كَانَ الرَّجُلُ إِذَا قَرَأَ بَقَرَةَ وَآلِ عِمْرَانَ جَدَّ فِينَا 
that amongst us, if a person read Surah Al-Baqarah, Surah Ali Imran, and reading doesn't just mean you know reading with just the Arabic, but rather memorizing, understanding, studying. So when a person amongst us had studied Surah Al-Baqarah, Surah Ali Imran, then he became of high status amongst us. You understand? Jadda, Jadda fina. He became of high status amongst us. So Jaddu Rabbina, the glory of our Lord, the Sultan of our Lord, the Qudra, the ability, the power, the Jalal, the Azama. So all of this is what? Jadd is Ta'ala. Wa annahu Ta'ala Jaddu Rabbina. The Jadd of our Lord is very exalted. And this is why Matakada Sahibatan. Sahiba is the feminine of Sahib. And who is Sahib? Companion. And the word Sahiba is used for a wife. Why? Because a wife is meant to be the companion of her husband. We have learned wa sahibatihi wa banihi. So Matakada Sahibatan wala walada. Far exalted is he above taking a wife and having children. Now we see over here that the jinn, when they accepted Islam, they believed in the Qur'an. They realized the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as well. They professed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's magnificence above having taken any spouse or any child. Because if you think about it, the desire to have a wife or a child is a weakness of who? The creation. And the jinn realized immediately that if Allah is so exalted, He doesn't need a child. He doesn't need a spouse. وَأَنَّهُ كَانَ يَقُولُ سَفِيهُنَا عَلَى اللَّهِ شَطَطًا And that our foolish one has been saying about Allah an excessive transgression. وَأَنَّهُ كَانَ يَقُولُ That he has been saying. Who has been saying? سَفِيهُنَا The سَفِيه amongst us. The foolish of us. سَفِيه Who is he? Someone who is foolish. Someone who is incompetent. Basically it's from Safaha which means to be light in weight. So Safih is someone who is light minded. Doesn't understand much. And in the Quran, the word Sufaha has been used for who? The Munafiqeen. As well as the Yahud. In Surah Al-Baqarah, Ala innahum humu sufaha Sayakulu sufaha umin nas So in one instance it's the Munafiqeen, in the other instance it is the Yahud. If you think about what is common between the two, did they have ilm? Did they have knowledge? Yes. But did they have amal? No. Did they have sense that would lead them to amal with that knowledge? No. So, safaha, foolishness, is when a person knows, however, he doesn't have the understanding. He lacks understanding. Which is why he does not relate it with his life. Which is why he does not apply the knowledge in his life. Which is why he doesn't act on what he knows. There is ilm but no amal. So, وَأَنَّهُ كَانَ يَقُولُ سَفِيهُنَا The foolish one amongst us has been saying عَلَى Allah against Allah shatata. What does shatat mean? Shatat is literally ifrat of bord, Meaning to be extremely far away. And shatat is used for that which is very very far away from the truth. Remember the two men who came to Dawood a.s. They said to him, فَحْكُمْ بَيْنَنَا بِالْحَقِّ وَلَا تُشْطِطْ That make judgment between us with truth and do not be unjust. So shatat is what? That which is far from the truth, kathib, a lie, and also jawr, injustice. So the foolish one amongst us has been saying about Allah outrageous statements, atrocious lies against Allah. Now who is this foolish one? Amongst the jinn Who has been saying extremely wrong things About Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Iblis And remember the definition of Safi Why did they call him foolish? Was it that Iblis was ignorant? No He had knowledge So وَأَنَّهُ كَانَ يَقُولُ سَفِيهُنَا عَلَى اللَّهِ شَطَطًا And what is it that Iblis was saying about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? What is it that he was saying about him? That wrong things about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaching or telling his people or his children or his offspring his armies that they should worship him that they should obey him and not worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so rising up against Allah saying wrong things about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala turning 
so many amongst people and jinn away from Allah by his lies. If you think about it, negative thinking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, where does that come from? Shaytan as well. Similarly, associating partners with Allah, who inspired that to people? Shaytan. So this is the shatat. And if you think about it, Iblis, how did he speak in the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at the incident when Adam a.s. was created? In a very disrespectful manner. Isn't it so? He was arrogant, he was rude. فَبِمَا أَغْوَيْتَنِي Because you led me astray. It's your fault. أَنَا خَيْرٌ مِّنْهُ I am better than him. So he spoke in a very arrogant manner as well. And this is why the jinn, they call him Safi. Because when a person honors and respects someone, then in reality, who is he honoring? Himself. Because your respect is in your hands. When you give respect, you get respect. And when a person insults the other, deals arrogantly with the other, humiliates the other, tries to insult the other, then who is he in fact insulting? Himself. Because the one who does not give respect does not even get respect. If you think about it, on the other hand, the angels, how does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describe them? Kiraman. Isn't it so? Kiramin barara. Kiraman katibin. Why are they honorable? Because they obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They never disobey Him. In the same gathering, earlier, what did the angels say? وَنَحْنُ نُسَبِّحُ بِحَمْدِكَ وَنُقَدِّسُ لَكَ When they spoke to Allah, they spoke with so much respect that لَا عِلْمَ لَنَا إِلَّا مَا عَلَّمْتَنَا we have no knowledge except what you have given us. They spoke with so much respect. And look at how they also deserve respect. Look at how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about them. Kiraman. Honorable angels. And on the other hand, Iblis, he was arrogant, he was disrespectful, he was disobedient. And how he fell in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and also in the eyes of people. That look at that. That the jinn are calling him Safi. Just imagine, the jinn are calling him Safi. He is supposed to be the leader of all of the shayateen. And these believing jinn, they call him Safi. Now, why is it that the jinn said this about Iblis? وَأَنَّهُ كَانَ يَقُولُ سَفِيهُنَا عَلَى اللَّهِ شَطَطًا Why are they saying this about him? Because they recognize the greatness of Allah when they heard the Qur'an. Those who recognize the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how do they speak about Allah? In a very respectful manner. And those who do not recognize His greatness, how do they speak about Him? In an evil manner, in a bad way. And in fact, they are being foolish. And the first to do this was who? Iblis. So Safi primarily refers to who? Iblis. But after Iblis, it refers to all of His followers as well, who have been following His footsteps. So, وَأَنَّهُ كَانَ يَقُولُ سَفِيهُنَا عَلَى اللَّهِ شَطَطَ By this statement, it is as though the jinn they are completely disowning themselves from who? Iblis. That we have nothing to do with Iblis. We don't agree with him. We don't follow him. We don't listen to him. And this shows their courage and their confidence. Because it's not easy for a jinn to say something like this against Iblis. Just as amongst people, it was not easy for a person to profess his iman in the presence of Abu Jahl, in the presence of Abu Lahab. It was not easy. It was like inviting people to attack you. So, what does this show over here? The truthfulness of their iman and also their confidence, their courage. We listen to the recitation and then we'll continue. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to who? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So look at their reflections. How they are discussing amongst themselves and what kind of things they are saying. How they are glorifying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and how they are talking about what is right and what is wrong. What is truth? What is falsehood? We listen to the recitation. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Qul uhiya ilayya annahu istama'a nafarun min al-jinn faqalu inna sami'na qur'anan ajaba yahdi ila al-rushd fa'amanna 